I'm very delighted to announce Blake, um, who will give our um, last leader. Hi, Blake, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Good, we can hear you perfect. So I will introduce you uh, a bit and then you the stage with yours. Um, Blake, uh, Ellen is Associate Professor and Program Director of Counseling Psychology at the University of Houston. His broad area of interest is in work psychology, combining research and perspectives from a variety of fields, such as counseling psychology, vocational psychology, industrial and organizational psychology, and management. Blake's specific area of interest is investigating the predictors and outcomes of the work quality, operationalized as underemployment, precarious work, low wage work, meaningful work, and decent work. And Blake Allen is also a colleague of David, and so their uh, presentations or talks will align very well, and we are very happy that you join us online. Thank you. Thank you. Um, everyone can hear me okay? So I'm I am uh, I'm just disappointed that I couldn't be there with all of you. I have a two year old and a five year old, so travel is difficult right now. But I hope I get a chance to um, meet all of you in person sometime. And um, I see some familiar faces, my good friend David. So it's really great to um, to be here. So I uh, I'll go ahead and I'll share my slides here to start. So this is uh, what I wanted to talk about. I I, I struggled in um, doing a keynote in, in half an hour and sort of not wanting to present on uh, kind of a model that I've done or what I'm doing in my research, but to offer a, a challenge to us and a challenge that I have been struggling with um, for a long time since, you know, the beginning of my research journey. And so this is sort of my title is talking about the spirit of the time and offering a, a challenge to us as precarious work scholars. And hopefully this can shape some of the discussions that you're having or you're going to have next. So I have kind of in my journey, I've always had this, this internal tension. And wh what I started out with when I was in my early 20s, I was really interested in meaning in life and what gives us a sense of meaning and a sense of meaningful work and fulfillment and well-being. And that's what I studied probably for the first five years. But I started really questioning that and saying, you know, is meaningful work a privileged problem in a sense? And what is the, the defining problem of our times in terms of work? And where I landed was this idea of underemployment and precarious work. So I can imagine a lot of you are in the, in the same place of sort of this is a really important issue. And this is where I want to spend my time looking at the struggle that workers are going through, deprivation and anxiety. But this has always kind of created this tension for me, this tension of, you know, where do I focus my efforts? Whereas, you know, most people want work that's fulfilling and meaningful, but don't have the ability to choose the work that's going to, to provide that for them. When I dug deeper into this issue, I realized that this tension or this sort of living between two poles is not just my struggle, but it's a defining struggle of our time. So that's, I'm going to explain that in more detail. So really to figure out, you know, where we're at in society right now, we kind of look at these social movements or the zeitgeist. So I, I'm, I'm sure you are all familiar with what that is. So the sort of philosophical, moral, intellectual, or artistic climate of an era, how are people sort of what is the sort of collective unconscious that's coming together to try to understand where we are? And so some of these are romanticism, realism, and then starting in the 20th century, we have modernism and postmodernism. And what I'm going to talk a lot about today is this idea of metamodernism. What's emerging right now in where we are in terms of intellectual movements and what people are looking for and what people are, are, are needing? And it reminds me of a joke I always tell to my like first year graduate students when we're talking about culture. As there's this, this sort of parable, if you will, of the frog says to the fish, you know, what's how's the water today? Or what's the water like? And the fish says, what's water? You know, the fish has no idea that they're in water because it's just their environment and their climate. And so what I wanted to do for this talk is to kind of step back and look at what, what is the climate that we're in right now and how is that influencing 
you know, our models, our theories, and our interventions, and how we should develop those going forward. So I'm kind of going to ignore uh, romanticism and realism, you know, which is the 19th century, and really start at modernism. And so what was modernism? So modernism was this response in the early 20th century to industrialization, to try to align uh, art and philosophy and intellectual movements with the experience and values of this sort of new way of living, moving from an agricultural society to an industrial society. And there was this rejection of the 19th century realism and there was a lot of abstraction and experimentation. You can think of like existentialism and expressionism. But there was this underlying focus on idealism and progress and utopianism. So you can think of the early 20th century, like the progressive era, um, even sort of the darker sides of utopianism, things like eugenics. Um, also happening at the beginning of the 20th century are things like um, the communist re revolution, sort of this utopian vision of society. Um, and within, especially like art and film, there's these linear stories that fit with these morals or themes that fit with these grand narratives of the time, sort of accepted narratives, which we know didn't fit for everybody because we were raised mostly in postmodernism. So we understand those grand narratives are not true, but there's a real buy-in in the modern period. So this is sort of, you know, early 20th, 20th century to like the 1960s. And in my field of, you know, vocational psychology and career counseling, where I was kind of raised in a sense, um, you think of these mid 20th century theories, like you can find the perfect fit, right? Frank Parsons, um, sort of, you know, the father of vocational psychology talked about, well, if you can get everyone the perfect career, they're, they're going, it's going to make society really efficient and better. And it's this progressive era thinking. And there's more of this sort of stability and loyalty during that time. So to kind of illustrate modernism, I don't know really anything about art. I, do, I don't know much about architecture or poetry or anything like that, um, but I do know about film. So some really good sort of modern examples. So you might know Top Gun, you know, and, and even the, the recent remake is very modernist. It's sort of like, um, you know, in terms of the United States, sort of U.S. values and, and that kind of thing. And the second movie I have there is Seven Samurai by Akira Kurosawa, which is an amazing director from the 1950s and 60s. You might not know him, but um, he made a lot of samurai movies, which are very much like Westerns. It's like the samurai are these good people who come in and save the day and they have these morals and values and they always win in the end. Um, and so it's very much like Westerns. You can think of, you know, John Wayne Westerns and things like that. When we get to the 19s and 1960s and 70s, you know, the civil rights movement, and there's more of a skepticism towards these grand narratives. And this is sort of where postmodern modernism comes in. And what people are arguing is that postmodernism ran up until sort of the end of the 90s. And so postmodernism is really deconstructing these grand narratives. So something I know David has talked about a lot is deconstructing this idea of the grand career narrative, that everyone goes through the same stages in career. Especially as precarious work researchers, we know that that's not true, that it's a lot more chaotic and people are trying to meet their survival needs versus follow this um, you know, prescribed notion of what career is. And, um, you know, as... As you, you, I mean, we were all kind of raised mostly in the postmodern period, unless you were born, you know, in the late 90s or in the early 2000s. So we really intuitively understand postmodernism, this kind of rejection of objective truth and meaning, this understanding of subjectivity, sensitivity to how structural factors like power and culture determine what is true to us as individuals. And so there's this move from positivism to more constructivism. And again, in my field, or well, in all of our field, like work, um, psychology and things like that, there's a lot more self-reflection, -refle critical analysis of power structures, narrative techniques. And I, in, in my field, in particular in vocational uh, counseling and career counseling, this idea of career construction, like following our own narratives, understanding that and developing meaning based on that. And so again, coming back to kind of movies, so a classic postmodern comedy is Monty Python and the Holy Grail. 
very nonlinear storytelling. Everything's kind of silly and pointing out the absurdity of everything, but there isn't a determined, there isn't a sense of clear meaning or moral purpose or moral message. Um, and the same with Pulp Fiction, um, that kind of idea, very nonlinear storytelling. Another thing about Pulp Fiction that you've seen in other movies like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, if, you, if you've if you seen that from the 60s, where um, you have anti-heroes, like the baddie is the um, protagonist of the story. So we're seeing things from their perspective and we notice, oh, there's a subjectivity here. Like the value system is based on their point of view, not so much this objective truth or idealism or utopianism. And so, like I said, I mean, we're all very intuitively understand postmodernism, but scholars in all these different fields, uh, film criticism, philosophers, et cetera, are arguing that postmodernism is dead. And it is no longer a, um, a worldview or a climate or an understanding of the world that can help us solve the problems that we're trying to solve. Um, and really what they've argued, not in the same uh, words as, um, they wouldn't call it precarity, but part of my talk, I wanted to build off David's talk as well on talking about precarity, but scholars have argued that Metamodernism as sort of the zeitgeist is a response to this precarity that we're going through. This chaos in terms of precarious work and uh, climate change and pandemics and globalization and everything that's making our word and uh, the exponential growth of technology is a good example too. Everything that's making our world really chaotic and uncertain. That we're that artists and in, in uh, and, and scholars are responding to this through metamodernism. And metamodernism is really unique in that when you look at art and things like that that come from this, it's sort of living in between modernism and postmodernism. It's learning the lessons from postmodernism, that there are deep inequities in society, that subjectivity and point of view and perspective and positionality matter, but also kind of drawing lessons from modernism in terms of having an ideal, having a need for meaning, idealism, hope, and a sense of vision and purpose of where we want to go. Um, another word that I, I saw in another talk when I was looking through the program is sustainability, right? Like looking towards the future and what we can build. And people describe it as this sort of pragmatic idealism that we're acting sort of as if, um, this society that we want can be built while knowing with our postmodern cynicism that it's probably not going to happen, but we can hold on to that ideal and that hope. Um, and there's a so one another way to look at it is um, modernism was very construction, constructing a um, grand narratives and hope and meaning and something that we can adhere to, whereas. Uh, postmodernism is deconstructing that and metamodernism, we're reconstructing that in a new way. So sort of the postmodern irony to uh, kind of a new sincerity. Um, and so this is tough because I don't see a lot of theories that are really metamodern because this is just emerging from, from the 2000s. But I see psychology of working, uh, you know, Bluestein et al. Um, is really starting to wrestle with this by creating decent work as sort of an aspirational goal from the ILO, of course, but also recognizing the structural constraints that people are, are facing. Um, protein and boundaryless careers kind of have elements of this too, understanding um, the world that we live in and the chaos and needing that sort of the sense of self and meaning because postmodernism deconstructs the self, uh, metamodernism tries to reconstruct it and hold on to a sense of identity. So some great movies. I mean, um, the perfect metamodern movie is Everything Everywhere All at Once. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's I'm not going to give any spoilers, um, but it's really showing the chaos that we're facing with social media and technology, um, but not succumbing to nihilism, finding that sense of hope and sincerity um, within that chaos. And um, Michelle Gondry and Wes Anderson, if you know those movies, are very kind of um, ha have sort of this, this quirky naivete um, that 
but having a sense of meaning in this in the sort of weirdness or the oddness um, from, from postmodernism. Okay, so what is all, how does what how is this relevant to us in thinking about the world? Well, I think our challenge, as I mentioned, is that you know we have um, a deconstruction and then a reconstruction. So the you know the picture on the the far right of the girl with the pearl e earring. You know what what is the new vision that we are going to offer when we are focused on precarity and precarious work and all of the anxiety and deprivation and alienation that comes from that space. And so I kind of come back to the tension that I had in my first slide is, you know, living in this tension between precarity and precarious work, but offering a vision of decent work and what what I kind of uh, just a word, I think it is actually a word, but I, I kind of I came up with salubrity of doing with health. So I kind of defined it as, you know, what is the antithesis of precarity, a social, economic, political and personal condition or a dynamic characterized by security, hope, equity, dignity, well-being and sustainability. So I think this has been my challenge in my work, vacillating between this idea of meaning and meaningful and fulfilling work and precarious work and precarity. And, and um, I think our challenge as precarious work researchers is to live in between um, in a meta-modern way, kind of live in between these two realities, understanding those lessons from postmodernism and the difficulty of the world that we're living in now, but also offering an ideal or um, a vision of the future that we want to move towards so that we can offer a pathway in order to get there. Um, and so uh, one of the techniques that metamodern scholars talk about is this kind of um, performatism. So it's believing in something despite of itself, informed naivete, that sort of like pragmatic idealism and um, what Kant talked about, this sort of act as if thinking, um, which as a trained therapist, I used with clients a lot, sort of, well, act as if you're, you know, um, you had the things that you're looking for. If you had the relationships you want, you know, act as if, what would that look like? And so offering, um, offering that vision, I think is really important. And I don't have the answer of what that vision is in its entirety. Um, but it's something that I'm struggling with. So here is one model that I offered. Actually, I'll give a shout out to um, uh, David Bluestein, Lisa Flores's book that I wrote a chapter in, and I and I wrote this chapter called Worker Fulfillment. And my argument in this chapter was that we need to stop using um, indices that don't really capture workers' experiences. So indices like the unemployment rate. Now we know the unemployment rate is important. Um, but or the growth of the stock market, right? I mean, these are indices that we use to indicate the strength of the economy and the and the strength of worker well-being. Well, the unemployment rate is five, four or five percent. Uh, you know, we're okay. And instead, start looking at and building indices that measure whether workers have voice and protections in the workplace, whether they are experiencing fulfilling work, things like meaningful work, um, work engagement, job satisfaction, positive emotions at work, whether they're um, experiencing well-being and mental health, measuring the strength of the social safety net, and whether there are you know, indicators of social justice and equity, human rights and dignity, decent work, and whether um, workers have opportunity for career development and advancement. And I know that many of you are working on areas within this. Um, and I, and I, I'm not making the argument that we're not wrestling with this tension. Um, I'm making the argument that we are. I mean, that, that we are doing this work. It's just that we need to sort of step back and look at the climate that we're in and the particular challenges and what people need. And that kind of fits with intervention as well, developing if we're working on an individual level with precarious workers, that we're helping them wrestle with the sort of cynicism and deconstruction while also helping them move forward and developing that sense of meaning and hope and idealism. And so no one is arguing that postmodernism is bad. It's just arguing that it was the zeitgeist and now we have a new zeitgeist 
and we need to adhere our work that is going to offer what people need. Wanted to just um, mention too, uh, so part of that model that I just talked about is this of social justice and equity is this idea of radical healing, which is this model that um, you know just came out a few years ago. In, and this is by uh, Brianna French and colleagues, and it, this was published in the, the Counseling Psychologist. And um, when I looked at this model and I was reading about metamodernism, I was like, wow, this is like a total metamodern theory. And they've probably never heard of metamodernism, but this, they're offering this theory. And so this is um, an example of, uh, or their, their figure from their model. And so on the left there, they, they're sort of acknowledging the interlocking systems of oppression and hate that uh, exist in the world, but also envisioning justice and liberation and what that looks like. And in the middle is radical healing. That's where the sort of healing is taking place while acknowledging um, positive aspects of, of the human experience, like cultural authenticity, self-knowledge, critical consciousness, hope, um, support, strength and resilience and so on. And so this speaks to me. I mean, when I first, as I mentioned early on, when I first got interested in research, I was really interested in positive psychology. That's what I wanted to study, the positive side of, of human existence. Um, but I felt like, well, that's not enough. We also have to look at the other side and that there, there's that wrestling with that tension. Um, and so I wanted to uh, leave you all with uh, this quote. And I, I did want to mention too, this idea of metamodernism. It has a lot of different names, but um, Vermeulen and Van der Acker were, um, their, their 2010 article was really uh, what popularized um, the term. So again, this is very new, um, but this is the uh, quote from their article, inspired by a modern naivete, Yet informed by postmodern skepticism, the metamodern discourse consciously commits itself to an impossible possibility. Um, so I kind of like that fitting with that, um, looking towards that vision. Just so to sort of close again, I want to say that um, I think um, what I wanted to do in a half an hour talk was not give any answers or provide some model, but just challenge us to start thinking about. Uh, what is that vision that we want to offer of um, stable and secure work and how do we get there and how do we wrestle in that sort of between space where there's that tension. Um, so that's it for my talk. Thank you very much. Five minutes early. Um, so I think we have time uh, for five minutes. If someone has a comment or thoughts, uh, I'd love to hear it. Thank you so much, Blake. And it was a pleasure to be with you. Any questions? Use the opportunity. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Thanks, Vic. Uh, um, so I suppose. You've taken us on quite a, a whistle stop tour of, of positions. Um, I wonder what you would say to the US government at the moment about sort of employment policy and, and, and how we, we protect the rights of workers. Well, I think, um, <laughs> so, I mean, again, just sticking with my theme, um, the polarization of the politics is part of this space that we're occupying, kind of um, navigating the, the, the political polarization and how that creates um, stagnation, especially in the United States with this polarization and the inability to get anything passed and the reliance on executive orders to get anything done because Congress isn't passing anything. Um, so I think, um, we know the policy positions that we need in our national context in terms of having a living wage, providing more worker protections. Um, I think one thing I, I wrote about uh, in a chapter that I just finished was talking about how we really need to understand precarious work within context. We, we, we don't need one definition of precarious work. We need multiple definitions based on the national context. 
And the national context of the United States is we don't actually have a ton of temporary work compared to other nations. Um, there's more full-time work, but we have at-will employment, meaning that employers can fire you for no reason at any point. And there are very limited protections for full-time workers. So you can hire full-time workers and then just fire them when you don't need them. So, um, you know, what precarious work looks like in the United States is very different from other, other national contexts. And I think my perspective would be, it would be more of uh, looking at, um, which I, you know, we've done in our work is looking at poverty wage employment, needing increases in the living wage and needing a lot more protections um, for full-time workers in addition to uh, temporary contract workers and so on and so forth. Um, so it's a big question. I mean, I can talk about that in um, an hour long talk too. Um, but I think what I come back to in my theme is really, this is part of what we're wrestling with, that sort of space in between um, polarization, extremism, and uncertainty. Thank you. Ross? Thank you very much for really engaging and switching us into a very different space from the one that we've been in earlier today. I wanted to ask you particularly thinking about new researchers, where they should be putting their energy and efforts into starting to unpack the space that you did with mental. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think, you know, my wife and I were talking about this. I was telling her a little bit about my talk and she's like, oh my goodness, I've never heard this term, but this is my worldview. This is my perspective. Um, and so I think the new researchers coming in have not been raised in postmodernism like many of us have. They are bringing in this perspective. They are wanting uh, that sense of idealism and hope and meaning. So honestly, my 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 reaction to that isn't so much that I have advice for new researchers, but I want to have conversations with new researchers who are just coming in and understand their worldview and their perspective and their um, intellectual way of seeing the world, because I think we can really learn from that to understand the climate and where we are in society right now. Um, so I guess like, yeah, that's my gut reaction is that if I were speaking to um, a new researcher, which I wish I was there with you that I could do afterwards, um, I would be asking a lot more questions than I think um, doing what I've been doing in terms of a didactic, because I would really want to understand um, how people are seeing the world and what they need and what they think that um, us as intellectuals need to be providing. Thank you. One last question or comment. I have a question. Perfect. Blake, I um, great job. It was really a wonderful presentation, very stimulating. Um, so I, we just talked about this briefly. So this is a, my first time hearing it all the way through. I think it's really wonderful. So I think I guess one question I have is. Um, just going back to postmodernism, I remember reading critiques of postmodernism. Well, not so much. Well, one of the critiques of postmodernism was that it was it had this view that um, that it was kind of not taking a stand on specific values. Yes, I know that Isaac Prelitsky raised this issue, and yeah. I, I really resonated with that. That I, I kind of. Um, Thought of it as this idea, like the uh, I did reference the Beatles earlier. I reference them again. The song "Strawberry Fields" that nothing is real. Yeah, it's a classic, classic example of postmodernism. But is metamodernism? How do, what's the position of this perspective in relation to values about human rights, decency, and things like that? Yeah, I think that, that's a great question, David. Yeah, and I was thinking, David, if you gave this talk, uh, um, your examples would all be for music um, of uh, postmodernism and modernism and things like that. Um, and you can kind of see the Beatles like go through the different stages, right? Um, I want to hold your hand to like, uh, you know, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds um, from modernism to postmodernism. So I think, again, like this idea or this perspective is, I guess, like, we're all just still trying to figure it out, but that's what people are arguing is that 
it's this recommitment to human rights, this recommitment to an ideal future with that postmodern skepticism. Um, and so like a good example is this sort of postmodernist um, yeah, deconstruction, you know, individual perceptions of truth. And then you have Obama, who's who is kind of metamodern, right? This is sort of hope and change. And then in the United States, you have Trump, who he was saying, you know, there is no truth or truth is what I'm saying. And all of us, uh, you know, liberals, not to get too political, but are saying, no, there is truth. There is objective truth. But then that creates this sort of cognitive dissonance and tension where it's like, well, but we have these postmodern ideals of like, you know, respecting individuals, value systems and things like that. And so I think there's more of that tension being created right now. And I think what my guess is, is we're going to have this sort of recommitment to these, um, these higher values of human rights and things like that as, as sort of, you know, for lack of a better term, objective, um, values or truths of human rights and things like that, but viewed through this new lens and this new way of seeing it of with this, you know, postmodern um, skepticism uh, and this sort of idea of pragmatic idealism. Thank you so much, Blake. Um... We hope to to invite you next time or to, to have the opportunity to meet you in person. Uh, it's I think it's quite a challenge to have a keynote online. So this is why we decided to keep to uh, yeah to cut your time a bit. So because speaking in front of the screen is quite quite challenging. And this is uh, only. Uh, can you see this? Yes. This is, yeah. <laughs> this is only a small gift as appreciation. Thank you so much for your time and for your thought-provoking um, ideas um, and offering this new perspective on precarious work and precarity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, looking at the um, looking at the schedule, the thing that hurts me the most is it says a, a nice walk to the pub. And so that's uh, you know, what I'm going to miss out on the most. So I hope you all have uh, a wonderful um, rest of the conference. And yeah, I hope to see you all in person sometime soon. <laughs>